Oh, hi there. We're glad you're watching one of our virtual lunch presentations. We have a lot of good information that we've been accumulating over the past several years. And we invite you to look down uh, just below here and hit the subscribe button. And the little bell will give you a reminder of when our next presentation is published here on the YouTube channel. Thanks for your support. Appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to mention that uh, this week, uh, we're happy to uh, let you know that it's our friends at Kintronic Labs that are behind us. Uh, Kintronic Labs is, well, they've been going since the, what, 50s now, and uh, really have uh, uh, taken care of, of so many uh, folks over the years. Whatever you have a need for, uh, they'll have it. And now they have that uh, uh, store uh, online, three generations of, of uh, kings, and Joshua now is in charge of everything. And if, if there, there he is, Joshua. And if you look at the top of the uh, page up here, uh, they have their little store and whatever you may need in the middle of the night, uh, they'll get out to you first thing in the morning. Sometimes uh, Tom or, or Joshua will be there and they'll spin it out that evening and get it out to you. So uh, really, uh, it's always good to uh, have Kintronic Labs uh, as a friend and partner, and we invite you to check with them uh, anytime you have needs. Not just AM, they do FM uh, things as well, everything from dummy loads to uh, the uh, filters, and well, you get the idea. We have spoken in the past about tech support from companies, what to do when you have a need. And as an example, uh, we have uh, a gentleman with us today from Alaska. He's out there. Paul, can you get to your location by car or are you only by airplane? If his microphone works, but he's, he's way out there. And sometimes... There we go. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Um, we are 250 miles northwest of Anchorage, completely off the road system. For about eh, seven months a year, it has to be flown in. For the, the two days of summer, you can barge it in. And mail, if we're lucky, priority mail will get here in four or five days. Well, that's an extreme example, isn't it? Maybe our problem is yes. we we can't find the right part. There's no Radio Shack anymore to go get it. But just getting answers, uh, just getting to some of the tech support people at the different companies uh, is not always easy. And then, of course, there's another issue that I used to find important, and that was you can't be in two places at one time. So if you're checking two ends of a circuit, it's always good to have a friend, somebody in the market that'll come and uh, stand by and uh, or go over to your uh, little section of the transmitter site uh, so that they'll help you. Uh, but something happened, I think, and I want to hear your opinions and uh, your feelings about this. But somewhere in the early 2000s, it seemed like the AOL broadcast forum, the broadcast mailing list on the internet and other uh, locations for us to find help and assistance got splintered badly. In fact, I remember working with one company, a fairly large one, where the engineers were told not to post on any other mailing list and not to talk to other companies. And so that's a, that's a real issue, isn't it? Uh, where you've got a problem uh, finding somebody that is going to be able to help you without <laughs> getting in trouble with uh, some bureaucrat up the chain. Uh, so that's a problem. Some states have started a series of seminars in recent years. Uh, some stations have uh, put a mentor program together and some recruitment comes through the IT department. But what can we do? How can we help one another? Or maybe tell some of the stories how you have managed uh, to get good help. I find every so often somebody will post 
a message on the broadcast list. Broadcast has been there, by the way, since 1985, and the Tech Assist has been there since 1994. And it's just there for the purpose of professionals getting information so that they can connect with one another uh, any time of the day or night. You could probably find an answer pretty quickly. But again, uh, if we're so fragmented that you have to be at the right company at the right time, is that going to help? really. So let me ask uh, the group here as a whole, and if you're on the YouTube video watching us, you can make your comments in the chat box there and we'll relay them to the group. But how do you find your market? Are you alone uh, like Paul is out there in the middle of Alaska? When he has a need, he is in need. Uh, he'll tell us that he's not a general engineer in the sense that many of us are, but he needs someone to help him talk him through it. Now, if you're going to share with us, we can do it three ways. You can raise your hand and I'll call on you. You can unmute by hitting your space bar, or you can do an alternate A, or go to the chat box. And so we want to invite your participation and tell us, what does your company recommend? Do, does your company let you talk to people in the market? Or do they frown on that? I think that's a good question. So they oh, haven't they okay. haven't uh, put a uh, a bar in the telephone system to keep me from calling those people. So I keep calling them. <laughs> I, oh. I think I somebody said in the chat room. I guess Lee. I guess said said. Uh, it kind of seemed to have started with uh, with the, you know, all the how does this work and how do I how do you troubleshoot it parts of all the manuals and things and all that stuff went away. I think you know there was a time when radio stations had engineers actually on staff, not just uh, you know one to cover the you know the Western United States. Um, and uh, that kind of changed all about the same time. So no, people ran out of, of time to work on things and didn't have the information and they couldn't get the parts. Hmm. Still annoys me is all. No, for a large extension, SBE meetings were really the place where a lot of people got together and networked or at the NAB show in, in April. But the SBE meetings are much less attended to these days. In fact, here in Tucson, it got so bad that they sort of melded the Tucson chapter into Phoenix. And so if I want to go to a Phoenix meeting, I've got to drive 135 miles. And that kind of puts a kibosh on things. If, you know, you get a vendor pitch and a piece of pizza, is it worth the drive? Or Marvin, you're in LA, driving across LA during rush hour, is not exactly going to get you uh, to a meeting at the time. Gordon? We, we, we don't have a very active chapter here in the Denver, Colorado area. So I've actually, over the past three and a half years I've been in Colorado, attended more meetings in Portland than I have because part of my territory is Portland. So I schedule my maintenance visits around going to Portland just so I can still connect with people in SBE. Yes, and isn't it good, that, well, just like we are today, the Zoom has given us that opportunity to reach out to folks in, in these different areas and, or even carry a cam, show somebody what our hmm. rack looks like and we're able to assist them. Gordon, I, you got your hand up. Yeah, um, here in Chicago, um, and I have to admit, Chicago is a competitive market, but behind the scenes, you couldn't ask for a much better bunch of uh, guys. If you've got a problem, you need you need help. They'll give you information as much information as they possibly can. If you have a piece of equipment and it's got you off the air or 
crippled in some way. If someone's got it, uh, chances are they'll loan it to you until you can get what you got dealt with. It's um, it's nice like that. Um, and we and there's a couple of guys that have a better idea where the bodies are buried, you know, who's got what, but a um, couple of phone calls and or emails and chances are you're going to find what you need. Now, that's a very interesting point, too. And again, I, please feel free to comment, folks, and, and let us know how things are where you are. I, I think a few of you, I can uh, almost guarantee I know the answer. I've always been willing to tell someone at a station where I have been, what I know, the, the good things and the bad, the, the, you know, traps and the tricks. But I remember leaving one station and uh, they changed the locks on the, the door and uh, never, never called. The reason I know that is because when I went down there to move out my uh, personal belongings, uh, it, I had to have somebody come down and unlock the door as if I was going to cart the transmitter away. Never understood that. But how have you felt? Are, are you feel free to call the uh, guy or gal before you at the station and ask them about everything from licensing to where the wires go? Well, the situation in New York was very much like uh, Chicago. I remember in the 60s, I was forbidden legally from talking to my friends at WBZ. I was working for General Electric. They were Westinghouse, and there was some kind of, uh, I've forgotten exactly what it was, but uh, the two companies were alleged to be uh, in collusion with price fixing and that sort of thing. So we couldn't uh, communicate. You're talking about uh, the RKO mess? Uh, no. No, that would have been uh, WBZ and uh, WJIB uh, and uh, Channel 56, WKBG-TV. Uh, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was... Uh, Sounds like in both cases, it wasn't either group stations. This was about widgets or light bulbs or automobiles. That's something the monster companies both made. They were questioning the pricing. Probably had zero to do with radio or TV stations yet. The attorney simply said, yeah, we can't have any of A talk to B. Oh, no. we. Um, it was a price-fixing uh, issue. Had right, but not do. necessarily in radio. No, had nothing to do with GE Broadcasting or uh, Westinghouse, you know, broadcasting. I'd like to um, tell you about something I just discovered uh, when you mentioned GE and Westinghouse. There's a very interesting video on YouTube. Uh, do a search for George Westinghouse, and I think you will find it. And it goes way back and talks about the founding of those companies and how Edison and Westinghouse, you know, Edison was a DC man and Westinghouse was AC and all that feud that went on. And I thought to myself, when you mentioned GE and Westinghouse, I said, maybe that still carries on today that those two companies aren't very good friends. <laughs> but anyway, do a YouTube search for George Westinghouse. It's about, I think it's about an hour and I forget, I'm, I'm not quite finished with it, but I think I got another 20 minutes to go to watch on it, but it's a very interesting video. Yeah, I, I've seen it. Um, it's fascinating. Yeah, one was a saying that the other had more dangerous electricity. <laughs> yeah, well, that was a big thing in the beginning, right? Now, we were talking about uh, Radio Shack. Uh, I produced The End of the Road with Tom Bodet in Homer, Alaska. Uh, I was the producer, the engineer, the announcer. And if there hadn't been a Radio Shack in Homer, uh, we couldn't have done it. They kept the light on for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's true. They didn't always have exactly the right part that you needed, but usually you could find what you had to have to get back on the air 
and operate, which is good. I built an entire radio station in Bermuda with parts from the radio shack, except for the antenna, the transmitter, and the audio processor. And interestingly enough, that radio shack was owned by the longtime direct competitor on the radio on the island, which later went bankrupt. So, uh, real quick note: in the early, in the mid '80s, I went to work for Continental Electronics in Dallas as a, a, tr a transmitter engineer. Uh, I think I saw Jack Selmeyer is, is, on, is on here. Uh, had the benefit of, of working on a lot of his stuff in Collins. And one of the things that was unusual is their filament regulator card still had the old relays in it and it was a problem. So I redesigned that. I went to Radio Shack, well, went to the catalog and I selected the 7400 series uh, chips uh, at, at when I did my, uh, my, my uh, logic mapping, Carnot mapping on uh, design for that. <clears throat> and I remember uh, Ken Sides and others were looking at this saying, oh, and I put sockets on the, on the prototype. And they didn't, you know, they didn't necessarily agree with it. I said, look, a broadcast engineer is often going to the, to the, to the mall to the mall on a Sunday uh, during a thunderstorm to get parts. Yeah. So, so if you if you have a continental ever had a continental transmitter, I designed the filament regulator card to use Hell, chips that you could get from Radio Shack. Sitting right over here on the right side. Well, we had Jack here orally. Jack, can you turn your camera on? Well, that's what we're trying to do right now, Barry. I'm talking to Dan. Okay. Well, we've got some video. Oh, okay. It looks like the camera's pointed down. I don't know. Lark, I want to about the uh, engineers and right. if we communicate. I know when I was in Memphis, just like Jerry was saying, we weren't allowed to talk to our competitors. Like that was like a huge no-no, but we all did anyway yeah, because they- I don't, don't see any video from each other. other. So we were always sharing stuff and, you know, just under the radar, yeah. not telling anyone about it. You know, it turns out GMs didn't care so much about that as opposed to program directors. Depended upon the company, but yeah, you're, you're right. Well, and it also depended on the, if one of you was about to change formats or raid the other station staff, that's one set of problems. For the engineers, it was rare, you know, anything you could do to make something a lot better was going to be advertised ahead of time in the FCC filings. Your power increase, your, I'm going to sell this station by that station, it would all be publicized. And if you got the other station back on the air, the GM just loved you. Said you can come over anytime. Well, Joe's uh, comment about uh, Denver reminds me of a story. Uh, the late John Anderson was asked by his GM to go get some RPU equipment for a remote, and he said, "Wait a minute, what? What do you mean?" He says, "Oh, just go to one of the other stations and grab some of their RPU gear." Uh, he didn't want to do that, and the GM chased him down the street. I don't remember if it was either a knife or a gun, but he didn't stay there much longer. You can get a related problem. Uh, I work in a station in El Paso, and trust me, a Spanish station in El Paso, we had remote gear. We had vans. We had RPUs. We had multi-hop stuff. And they came in one day and wanted to really, they wanted to hit a bunch of venues at once. And in a pre-digital age, I borrowed probably every radio in that town. I remember walking through snow on the roof of the mall to wire some of that up. And the problem is it worked brilliantly. And then, you know, one weekend later, it's, okay, you can do all of that again for this, you know. And it was one thing to do it for all the Chevy dealers, you know, in a big order. And suddenly some little nightclub down in the lower valley wants the same treatment. And I'm like, okay, it's no good deed goes unpunished. I I, uh, I want to share this quick story. In Dallas, our top 40 station was doing very well. 
and there and so there's there's always the loudness wars you know in the uh uh gosh this this would have been the uh this would have been the 90s so i remember there was a particular uh engineer and, and i liked everybody i always got along well we had a great group in dallas but i said look you come over tonight and you can look because he wasn't sure what we were running because we were supposedly loud or whatever but we had compelling content we had a good morning dj kid craddock we were doing very well I said you come over tonight you can see what i've got it's an Optimod 8100 with XT2 chassis. And I'm going to, and you bring your greeny screwdriver. And I've got the, mod, it's all there. And you can adjust my audio processing to whatever you think is fair. And uh, he showed up. I think he was kind of amazed. And he looked at it. He was kind of shocked that it was something simple. And I said, you can adjust it. I'll leave it. I don't care because, you know, if you've got good programming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, but that was a fun night because it, he just couldn't believe I would do that. But I said, you know, we've got good pro. I'm not doing anything here. There's nothing sneaky going on. There really are no secrets in engineering. I don't care what, you know, all the process. I get a kick out of the pro. Oh, this is the one. This is the one with my secret setting, please. Um, so that, that's what I did, and uh, it was fun. Come bring your greenie. You can adjust the processing if you think I'm over the top. There you was a Houston station that had three sets of audio processing chains, and the idea was that visitors did not know what they had on the air. Hmm. But there was also one that was hidden behind the rack that was on the air. That kind of explains part of why some stations didn't want other people to see their gear. They were afraid that in the modulation wars of the 70s and 80s, that the other stations would get the idea. Well, you knew they would sooner or later, but you wanted to hold on as long as you could. I got the first 8,000 Optimod in Dallas, Fort Worth in 75, and everyone was calling me, how can you get your mod monitor to meter go up so far before your peak light flashes? What do you have? And I said, it's brand new. In three or four weeks, you'll know all about it. But, you know, I'm not telling you. Well, that's part of our getting to know one another. Uh, again, in many cities and in, in, in locations, over the period of years, either doing backup or changing jobs, a lot of folks really do get to know most of the stations or they've been to the transmitter site that's a shared site and generally get to have an idea of what's going on. Uh, Paul, you, uh, you've got your racks on your screen and maybe if you want to just show us a little bit of what you're doing there in Alaska, that might be an interesting thing for us to see. Something sure, uh, I've got to go in a couple. Got to go in a couple minutes, but I'll show every everyone what we've got. Uh, we're licensed for ninety watts. It's at, at sixty feet. That's the transmitter there, a BWTX three hundred V two. There's the EAS that I have to replace after a power outage fried the power supply. I think. Um, the silver box above it is a scientific Atlanta. That's what normally feeds the statewide TV translator network, but we also get our statewide public radio newscast from it every night. That's the Mnet machine uh, above it. Uh, a disused but should be used XDS for the statewide news. Here is, and, and, and you talk about hanging by a thread, um, we have six or seven, we call them repeaters because that's the word the public understands, satelliters. They're actual stations, not translators, could originate programming, but don't. We feed them with a brick link um, over the internet. It's satellite. I mean, it's literally the only option we got. It's exceed Viasat. There is no Starlink up here. We used to do phone lines years ago, but it didn't sound very good. 
Um, this is our uh, IMT, uh, iMedia Touch server. Uh, we do have a wheat, we, we are, we do have WheatNet here. We have a Wheatstone console. There's the gear. Um, here is our in use, not currently, but it's the NPR satellite receiver we use. We have another one in the rack. That's what I call a cold standby. I can power it up, plug it in and have it on the air in five minutes. And I've had to do that once when one started going squirrely on me because if I depended on UPS, it would be more than a week before it got here. And this is the studio. Wheatstone E1 console, um, iMedia Touch automation, CD players, record players, and CDs. And that's Coffee literally can. it. I, have, I am the only full-time employee here. The only other employee here that's oh. paid hey, is Paul, the mayor the who does the morning show. Hey, Paul, where's the dog today? Um, every, the every dog picture, hasn't every, made the trip. Hasn't every picture the, the on dog Facebook, hasn't made the trip yet. Every every picture the, on the Facebook, dog you got your dog the there. Yet. I to see. I, I pay money to see the dog. I bought the <laughs> hat. I bought the. Uh, the, the I want to see the dog. The, the dog. The dog is not mine, but the dog knows that I have dog biscuits here, and if I leave the door open, it will walk right in. And if I don't leave the door open, it knows how to stand up and turn the door handle and come in to the station to get treats. Well, thank is you. Your morning Paul. show uh, is your morning show three months long. There you go. I bought the hat. <laughs> There's the hat right there. Bought it from Paul. Uh -huh. Took him forever to get it here. So I want to see the dog. I paid for the hat. I want, in fact, there's the hat. I want to see the dog. <laughs> Uh, no, no dog here now. Well, let us know if one does show up. Talking about uh, the idea here of getting to know your neighbors, as it were, assuming that you have neighbors, uh, no offense to Paul, but this is an issue uh, that I've seen in different markets where some engineers don't care. They just don't want to know anybody else. And others really are very pleasant and outgoing and ready to help, uh, but don't have a lot of time. And then there are others that are just the connectors, as we might say, that uh, when I got here into Tucson, uh, after I came back from L.A. and vacation, uh, we used to meet together at the local Chinese buffet. There were 15 or 16 engineers in town at that time. And it, it, you don't have that many anymore. Uh, but we had a good group and we had a lot of interconnecting discussions, solving problems. I remember one night I was working on the transmitter at 2.30 in the morning and the phone rang. And one of the guys says, uh, I hear you bouncing on and off the air. Do you need any help? And to me, that's really what should pertain to any given local circle of engineers. SBE helped on that a lot. Well, we after, used to have a, we used to have a similar group in Sacramento. Um, all the engineers would get together and even some of the production people would show up to the meetings. Uh, we were pretty open in Sacramento about uh, between all the groups, but that was back in the late 90s. Um, but yeah, we always, there was similar to Chinese, we'd go to the Mongolian place where they had a big sign that say no press down because they didn't want you to compact your food before they put it on the grill. Looks like we have locomotive competition. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, that's uh, three of you guys now. <laughs> Well, this is the other reason I go to Portland all the time, okay? The Southern Pacific Daylight. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pop this up right now uh, because we have a few that have to go off to uh, uh, other activities this afternoon. But one of the things we have done is we have 
uh, radiolist.net. It's sort of a portal here where you can find uh, information, the broadcast list, uh, Tech Assist, some deeper conversations on Tech Zone, although it's been quiet for some months. EAS, need to know about EAS. There you have some, some history. You even have the alternate frequency, things that are of interest, but not really technical. And what we try to do is keep it on a collegial, professional level for most of the lists, but alternate frequency is uh, sort of open to anything except screaming and yelling at one another. And then of course, where are they now? Uh, sometimes we want to find out if we know where someone is or uh, have they retired or, or worse. So I invite every one of you to radiolist.net uh, to take part if you want. Uh, I think some of us have gotten tired of what happens on Facebook and places like that. And we do not allow flame wars. We do not allow uh, religious wars or political wars. So you might find that of interest to uh, take part in. I'm just wondering if, uh, if pub tech is still in existence. I was uh, in public radio for 22 years and a couple of different stations and pub tech was a great thing at that time. And I've met a bunch of the people that are on here even now. Uh, Grady, I've met years ago uh, through pub tech and a few other, other folks here too, but is it still extant? Pub tech is alive. Alive and well. Cool. I, I, I misplaced, well, I, the, the email that I uh, was using at the time went away, but man, it was a great list. It really helped a lot uh, to, especially as a new engineer, it really helped me a bunch. I think it's being hosted by Chuck Nyday now, I think. Chuck Levins. Thank you. It's part of his enterprise there. Chuck was doing it way back when too. Chuck yes. Levins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, it's funny, I posted on uh, PubTech a question had to do with uh, a Native American station trying to figure out their NPR satellite receivers like uh, Paul has there, uh, an older version. And somebody came on and said, what's he doing on here? He's not NPR. He's not non-com. Sometimes some of the lists get a little bit uh, protective. That goes back to wanting to be reaching out to one another. What about I really, I really enjoyed going to the Dallas SBE meetings, but uh, that's 120 miles one way. And, uh, you know, that's that's nearly 50 bucks just in gas at today's prices for me and in my current vehicle. And uh, that's not counting a meal, even though lately the, uh, the meals have been sponsored by whoever's giving the program. Yeah, I was. I had an opportunity to go to the Dallas one last year when I was down shopping for liquid cool transmitters, and um, I was I was really impressed with the turnout and uh, with the just with the people that were there. I found a good engineer to help me with some stuff down there. So um, really, uh, really impressed with Dallas on that. I I need to see if I can get to Dallas more often for their SBE meetings too. Tonight is the SBE meeting in Arlington of the Dallas chapter. Well, Joe, as long as you're talking about uh, liquid cooled transmitters, put you on the spot here and share some of what you know and what any of us who are looking to put a new transmitter in, uh, would we look for Rodian Schwartz? Would we look for uh, Gates Air? Uh, would we look for something else? Uh, well, we we went to Dallas because <clears throat> both brands were well represented down there. Uh, we ended up going with the Gates Air, uh, both for our Dallas station and for West Palm Beach. And uh, we, we had a real good uh, um, uh, person to help us out in uh, Don Stevenson to... Uh, who has installed a number of them in the area to teach us how to do it. And uh, then we went down to West Palm, three of us, and we installed the one down there ourselves. And it really was really straightforward, the install. Uh, everything worked right off. We're HD on both of them. Um, 
uh, it was a really good experience. Uh, and then the Portland um, SBE barbecue, which is coming up next month, uh, we're going to be uh, seeing uh, All Classical Portland up there, another station I'm familiar with. They uh, they installed the Rodian Schwartz. And uh, so I'm going to see how their install went too. There is also a roadie here in central Colorado, southern Colorado, actually. Uh, EMF has one up at a site that we share. And um, so I've seen a few of them. I've, I'm really liking the Gates Air. Uh, it's as soon as we fired it up, turned it on, it's been really dependable. Uh, the air conditioning in the building uh, is a lot easier to maintain now. Uh, during the really hot Dallas summer we had uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, when the outside temperature was reaching over 100, uh, when it did that last year, we'd be able to keep the building around 74, 75, but the air condition, both air conditioners were running constantly. Uh, when I was down there a few weeks ago and it was just barely hitting 100, uh, just one air conditioner was coming on and off every so often and it was staying 70 in the building. So uh, definitely we're, we're not, since we went HD in the process too, we might not be seeing the, the savings, energy savings that some uh, would, would think, but at the same time, it's gonna put a lot less load on the air conditioner and it's going to uh, uh, run much more efficiently, I think, than if we tried to do uh, air-cooled uh, HD, uh, we are gonna end up saving over what that would have been. So, so far my experience has been great. Mostly because, although I posted something on my Facebook a while back, when I started in radio, I didn't think I was going to need a mop. Uh, but uh, there have been a couple of times when filling the system and, and uh, getting it up to pressure that uh, needed to get a bucket and a mop to clean up after the, the mess that was left over. Interesting. Up until the 60s, of course, many uh, AM station transfers had uh, water in them. KFI mm -hmm. being one that uh, rings a bell in my mind. Uh, and of course, the VP50, uh, Gates VP50 was a water. But for various reasons, radio engineers got very afraid of them. And when I first saw the RNS down at NAB, uh, it was very interesting to know how many TV versions were on the air not leaking and were really welcomed by their engineering staff, which is why they. What with the FMs from RNS? Yeah, um, we just we we have a number of other Gates Air equipment uh, in our system. Uh, we have a lot of their their fax air cool transmitters, uh, and so we just kind of stayed along the same line as that with the Gates Air. I mean, the RNS is much quieter. I'll, I'll say the we, you walk into a room and you can barely tell it's running at all, even. Uh, uh, we, we're running 20 kilowatt units, and uh, the RNS definitely is much quieter. But uh, we just did the gates just because of our own. Uh, we, we run their Intraplex, a lot of those products. We have a number of the fax transmitters, the air cooled. So we just stayed with the gates gates line on that. Good thing you're not in California, like with the cars. They'd probably force you to put the sound there to make it sound like the fans <laughs> were running. <laughs> exactly. But this is the sort of information exchange that's that's so important, I, I think. And I, I try to get some of the uh, transmitter guys on. Uh, I tried with Gates Air, and they they canceled at the last minute. But we will have Jeff on next week, and uh, he'll be able to talk to us about Nautel. I talked to uh, Kyle uh, McGrill, and there's going to be some changes coming uh, in the transmitter line that he uh, has. Uh, so that'll be something to watch as we as we come along. And then, too, we have had a rather <clears throat> energized discussion on broadcast about a particular line of transmitters run by, well, some people call them Bernie Boxes. If you can guess what company that was. And let's just say they weren't the favorites of most people. <laughs> Which, itera which iteration are you talking about? There were several iterations of Bernie boxes. Well, we covered several of them, didn't we? Not so much the CCA bunch, but ITA, which Collins had to pull all of those back out. And now EO are sort of littering the landscape. 
The only transmitters that surpassed those were the QEI red boxes. And I just got rid of two of them in upstate Maine. I'm so happy to whisk those out of the building and put a BE in its place, at least for now. Yeah, they used to say if you want to walk into a, if you want to know which station is on the air, just look for the red rat. Or I'm sorry, if you want to know which station is off the air, walk into a room and look for the red rack. <laughs> well, they did that so the fire department could find it easier. <laughs> well, Bernie, the metal went red for a while. <laughs> of course, if you know the history, you know that Bernie passed away, uh, leaving a great deal of confusion and chaos. He, um, his son took over for a short period of time, but basically the way I understand it, saw the chaos, saw that they owed the village about $500,000 for the grant that they opened the factory with. He shut it down, ran away, and it went into bankruptcy. And he lived happily ever after. Well, we don't know. It's too bad. I remember John Ring and I drove from uh, Northampton, Massachusetts, where he was based down to, to Bernie's Florida plant. And aside from the long trip down there, it was really kind of fun to, to see it. You know, it's the first time I'd actually been in a transmitter manufacturer. And, you know, to meet Mr. Wizard for me was kind of cool at the time. This was probably 1978, 77, 78, something like that. Another sad one was uh, Omnitronics, which, as uh, many of you know, was bought by LPD. And then when Tom Spadea shut that down, he literally tossed all the parts and all the manuals and all the paperwork in the dumpster. And so there is almost nothing available anywhere. I had one of those, too. David and John Salt. Yeah, you know, they started out uh, with some good ideas. So all that stuff in there, Singer and Omnitronics, and there's a whole period of time there. There was a CSI transmitter, if I remember correctly. What else? Uh, several other off-brands, as we would call them today. Several generations of CCA. Don't forget McMartin. Wilkinson. Okay. Yep. Uh, McMartin, the wood panel transmitter. ITA. <laughs> Brown contact paper is our friend. And ITA was like an, was Bernie's earliest. Evidently, he well, and a bunch of RCA guys said, hey, here's some money. Let's go build transmitters. And they built them for Collins for a short while. And then, as Barry said, Collins came and followed up and mopped that up by taking them all back and said, okay, we'll build a new transmitter. And we'll trade you here. Take the new one and sign this agreement. We, you never saw us. We were never here. That happened with a couple of other brands they had. I had two of them. One was uh, Omnitronics. And um, the other one was the uh, Skip Marsden Solid State AM. And Did then, of course, Continental came out with that 60 kilowatt FM that they sold three of and had to take back. Did anybody build a Bauer transmitter? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. one in El, Denver once. El, Elcom Bauer, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Selmeyer built one. He right, ended yeah, up in Rio Doso. Radio stations, what a nightmare. Harold uh, Helikainen, who's not with us today, he, he did the kit, the 707 kit. I was wondering how that kit worked out. Well, they had a, they had a, temp, a Kelly girl install it on the NAB floor one year. Yeah, we... Uh, we had a bower at uh, WKOX Framingham, Mass, one kilowatt. We had a bower 707 when I was in school. And um, that was our uh, training transmitter for AM. There was a 5000J, I think, that someone in El Paso was looking to give away recently. Uh, there are more than a few in the in the West Texas area because Paul Gregg had lived there in the last years of his life and refurbished many uh, Bauer transmitters. And as Jerry Olson mentions here, he's got one of the FMs. I assume 602 is FM. Uh, 
but the Bowers were good transmitters by and large. They were not uncomplicated. They were not simple. The Wilkinsons seemed to be minimal parts compared to some of the other transmitters. And uh, I remember one of my first jobs down here as a chief engineer, uh, we had a, a 10 kilowatt Wilkinson that the previous engineer was literally scared to touch. There was a memo on the wall that said if there was a storm coming, turn the transmitter off, turn the breakers off, go stand outside till the storm passes. <laughs> Barry, was that an AM or an FM? FM. There was a 10 kilowatt Wilkinson at uh, Comanche Peak in El Paso, sat on the other side of a rack from my 20 kilowatt gates. And I wasn't scared of it, but over the years, it, it emitted some noises that were attention getting. Well, I called Wilkinson Central and I didn't speak with Guffey, but they said, well, what you might want to do is tune for the dip. And uh, I set the output meter at Oh, goodness, it was at 100%. I worked on the dip, got it down to 50, put it back to 100, got it down to 50 again, put it to 100 a third time, got it down to 50. And on the fourth time, it got down to 78. And that explained why the tube was black and the transmitter wasn't reliable. From that point on, I never had a problem with it. But I know a lot of people that swore at Wilkinson. Yeah, they yeah, used my to... first my first tube uh, transmitter, big tube transmitter, was a CSI, and it was actually two cabinets. There was a 3K that drove the uh, 25K, and it was a step start. And so you, the 3K or both units would come on. The 3K would step up to 3K, then the 25K. You'd wait another minute or so it would kick in and as soon as it kicked in, as soon as you heard the 3K kick in, you knew to go outside for a minute because when the 25K came on, it let off this huge gunshot and then it would just come right back up and it was fine. It would run for weeks and months. You had little <laughs> timing relays yeah. setting how quickly it did that. And I would always start by setting them half a minute apart. You watch it do its yeah. thing and then you start flooring it. The, uh, the problem was the... Uh, on the high power cabinet, your your high low was delta Y, and the micro switch on one contactor or the other would fail, and it would start pulling both contactors in at once, and then you'd 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 you know that you'd hit the high button, and if you had ten seconds, you'd wait the you know, ten nine eight seven six, and instead of a kerklunk, what you heard was suddenly I'm in a darkened room listening to the fans wind down. And you could walk outside and, okay, the f line fuses have emitted, you know, or have set fire to the lawn again. And uh, our yard is on fire. And it's just, okay, it's another day living with uh, CCA, CSI. There was another brand or two that, uh, Centronics. Mm -hmm. Centronics did not do it. So take that, I take that back. That was a different set of problems. Yeah, mine used to like to blow rectifiers like every seven, eight months, so I kept spares. <laughs> Wasn't it one of the uh, Harris, uh, was it HCK? My game was uh, off and I am muted, yes. Yeah, had the big uh, double step that went through a giant one ohm resistor and then bypassed it. But it was supposed to do it instantly. We're talking a few cycles of 60 Hertz. And if that started sticking, it would start blistering those resistors. And then right after that, the next time it would open one of them. And once that happened, there went rectifiers. Yeah, and it's just amazing the symptoms it could exhibit for this fairly simple failure. And Jack, yes, the Jack down there below me, once told me, if you ever neutralize one of these things, be sure and bring a spare pair of underwear. I always thought there should be an arc detector in the PA and a counter. And about every dozen kabangs, you would take that little, I called it the spatula, the little flag that would swing around. And it was one, so one plate of a capacitor and it was on a little miter gear or rack and bam miter gear. And uh, like I said, you'd see little arc marks in it. And after 
the requisite number of explosions, there'd be a, you, you could hold it up to the line and say, okay, yeah, we have holes now. We, uh, it may be time to replace this. Yeah, and you'd look inside a transmitter and there were teeth, hair, and eyes all over the walls. I mean, my God. Now, one of you may, may correct me, but uh, Continental, one of the changes that they did make to, well, remember the whole 816 series really was 1974 manufacturer, and they've never really gone beyond that. But they finally got rid of most of the little relays that were at the bottom of one of the cabinets that always got dirty, always failed. That was the one problem I ever had with those transmitters. I didn't realize they went away. I just thought they moved into the middle of the middle rack. Uh, you'd, still be, you'd still be tapping on relays or thumping the deck a little bit. But yeah, when those were in the pan near the I.O. at the bottom, facing forward, bottom left panel, like I say, you just start wrapping along the front of the box a little bit, and it's like, okay. And they were very fine little relays. Um, yep, been there, done that. Yep. But those did get better. They, the, it's, I guess everybody looks at parts count and cost of parts, but at some point, all the snubbers that went across the iron at one point, they said, look, you're supposed to disconnect these if you're running any amount of time at reduced power. And at uh, some point said, yeah, we're just going to stop putting those in. My very I, I, first I, transmitter was an 830H Collins FM. That was a good transmitter. It had old mercury vapor tubes in the PAs and everything, which I in, ended up replacing with solid state replacements. But, you know, considering that thing was designed like in the early 60s, that was a good transmitter. Yeah, I found out the hard way with the... Uh... 816 when I had to reduce power, and I don't think my nose has ever been the same since. I'm going to stop and remind everyone that's with us today, and those who will watch the video after we post this, look at all the experience. Look at all the knowledge here. Look at all the folks that have worked with these transmitters and found the way to make them work the best. And live to tell about it. And live to tell about it. <laughs> and we can. Yeah, and there's more people here than just Jack. <laughs> and we can bring this over to consoles as well, because Jack designed a console, not in, uh, you know, not uh, coincidentally, uh, but taking care of audio chains, audio processing, consoles, all these things relate back to the fact that many of us have experience that we can share. And sometimes you don't know how to get to that experience. And that's kind of why I'm doing this thing on, on Thursdays and why the BDR is there uh, to share some of this knowledge. And I invite folks that want to write a story or an article about the love hate affair they had with their transmitter or console or whatever. Uh, there was the one model that you mentioned the name of the trans the uh, console and the response always was so and so made good furniture. Well, old Ernie Ankley had some to do with some of the Collins consoles too, the old autograms. Well, his company was started because Collins wanted uh, consoles built, and he he was chief of. Was it WBAP? Uh, one of the yeah, yeah, years ago. And then he had an automation company for a short while, too. Yes, that didn't go over too well. No. But the, uh, the AC-10s, IC-10s, the yep. 6s and 8s. Yep. Bullet Built proof. like a brick. The worst part of them were the caps in the little modules that you had to change from time to time. But other than that, Physically, and those little octal sockets that if you weren't careful, you had to go in and retighten all the little tube socket things because they get loose and they'd make bad connections. But I've never you were getting into them to work. You needed one of two things. You either needed the whole thing on a counter that maybe would lean forward so you could get under stuff, yeah. or you would need the Tom Cruise harness from Mission Impossible to just kind of fly over it. Yeah, because the, the second you it's like, well, you have to pull up 46 wires to flip this module over to get to the underside. Didn't need to do it real often, but 
considering people were partial to, okay, I put the little box on top of the console. There are, you know, three tri decks and six singles of, you know, weighing three metric tons. Mm -hmm. But and you would auto, only do that once. And the auto starts, I always thought we're in the stupidest spot. No one liked having the buttons underneath the pots. But I don't remember a disc jockey ever breaking an IC. And it was probably, of all the consoles, it was probably the nicest metal work ever uh, were the ICs. And it was basically, it was a simple console. There wasn't anything magic in it. It was just super good construction and it was all hand wired. It was, and it was a sturdy frame. It was like a lot of products from the 70s and the early 80s. What it, when we started getting replacement cards for Optimod, somebody started, you know, an 8000 had nothing you could hot rod. You could change a few ICs, but an 8100 had a front that dropped down in cards. And pretty soon they're saying, well, we think of it as a technology platform. And I remember thinking, you know, it's pretty close to heresy to suggest something Bob Orban did was not the greatest thing ever. But we'd start putting cards in it. The autograms could be hot rodded like that. Uh, Indie Audio had cards. There were two or three manufacturers who had transformerless um, active like input. Like the prisms. Up. Remember the prism even sent you a new panel for the thing. Yes. Yep. Yep. And a new a replacement control card. And again, that was kind of, yeah, it worked really well. And it, what it meant was that Glenn Clark had, had learned a lot from that first generation of 8100. Apex, I think, was the very first. They would say, here's a compeller and dominator, and you don't really want to run it through the two AGC cards, cards, I think, three and four on the 8100, whatever, whatever that's not a filter, but the, the, two gain, the two compressor cards. And they said, here, we have two cards that are basically pieces of pegboard with 10-turn pots. You know, let our processing be the processing and get it into the Optimod stereo generator in the purest form. Yes, they like to compel, excite, and dominate. Like I said, that, that 8,000 rewrote the book. Well, it did. It did, because one of the first things that Bob operated off of was reducing the overshoot that was typical of most audio processing of that time and built every single stage of it in the same factory. You weren't getting a, a, a CPS, you know, leveler put into a Marty CLA 40 into a Collins stereo generator. It was one box, so everything was perfectly matched. Kind of like the way um, they do Apple computers. It's like your you know, Apple you ecosystem. Just, yeah, yeah, it's a full system. Well, and that is part of that's part of why so, we'd have stations in given towns that were such anomalies, loudness wise. Um, I remember one place where there was a local station that was was audibly louder than everyone around it in a town where everyone had the same gear, and it was put on us to ask figure out why is this because it wasn't our station; it was a competitor, and we we kind of went, "What do we know about?" It? Said, "Well, everybody was on composite STL except for that station." They were on EQ'd phone loops. They were very long EQ'd phone loops. And what we began thinking is those things acted as phase scramblers because they're all past filters. It, it sat there and made their audio. It was kind of like having the non symmetra mod. It was kind of like having any of a number of gadgets. But that same audio percent, for, or percent of audio for percent of modulation was louder than the things around it. And also, they didn't have a composite STL. They had their, you know, their stereo generator was last at the exciter at the transmitter. But we said, we're not going off this. We're, we're not going to a system like that to be 2 dB louder, but we would like to be the 2 dB louder. And Bob was really a pioneer in that he, he realized that the stereo generator uh, sh should be in the processing. He was the scientist and Eric Small was the salesman. Yep. yep. Well, then again, Eric also introduced composite clipping. Yep. And, and that and, I mean, 
Eric and Bob, uh, Bob is still a friend and Eric may rest in peace was a friend. He, uh, he also introduced um, the, the Stereo Max, uh, which was also a great uh, box as well. well and, nice. a, and a very complex and professional SCA generator that we ended up using in Dallas to put uh, little signs up in all the dark buses where they could uh, get telemetry sent to the buses and people could buy advertising on it. Yeah, Eric, Eric basically rewrote the book on SCA. Generation. But also also the things that would take your composite and feed it over a half mile of, of twin lead and gadgets like that. If you needed to get from this building to that building through a you know, conduit in the parking lot, uh, he had a lot of things like that. He had the mod, mod minder. Uh, you know, he advanced a lot of little parts of the business. He kind of thought like Steve Jobs, I think, would be a good comparison. He came up with these incredible ideas and then had the people to make them for him. Yeah, but the, Eric, Eric, to a lesser extent, was almost like uh, Leonard Kahn because Eric does love to argue as well. I mean, Eric was a genius, don't get me wrong, and so was Leonard, but Eric... Eric just liked to cause cause arguments. I, I think he actually enjoyed it. It was interesting at that time period, of course, with Bob. Uh, first, we had, of course, the, the Max Brothers. And then uh, Mike DeRoe and I came out with the DAP. And then uh, Pacific Recorders had the Multimax. Then, of course, we had Ron Jones. And for a long time, you had uh, CRL on AM and Orban Optimon on the FM because they were so different in their operation. Hey, Barry, one thing I've always wanted to know about the DAP, uh, the 310, uh, 310 was it? Um, that was his birthday. Well, I, I was going to ask, every 310 I ever worked with, the engraving was always slightly crooked. What was with that? He had a bad eye. He had the work done out in the valley, and uh, the companies that did that metal work were not, I don't want to say reliable, but let's put it this way. He never bothered to do a lot of uh, parts acquisition. It was sort of build them as he needed them for a long time. And I got a couple of his fancy VU meters in a rack over at my warehouse. If I remember, the 610 was like one of the first devices with anodized glue. Yeah, that was that was a disastrous uh, product. <laughs> but it was gorgeous. I borrowed a pair, put them on my station, and my uh, director of engineering who'd been in World War II came through and watched it and looked at the lights for a little while and said, oh, it looks like something you'd see on a cat house. <laughs> somebody once said, somebody once told me a, a, a comment, and I'm curious if anybody else heard it, because I always thought it was interesting, was that uh, this was attributed to Eric Small when he came out with the, uh, the what was it, the uh, CP803, uh, Ken, is that right? Uh, I'm watching you, if you nod your head or, right, or not, the uh, composite clipper. Uh, the quote was, I'm going to make a million dollars off of the paranoia of broadcasters. Probably, and it, you could always remote the back of the, the CP803 had that remote jack in the back that you can uh, always uh, take your uh, peak light out and uh, send it back down to the studio. So everybody's sitting there watching the light all the time because uh, you only allowed a certain amount of peaks uh, at a time. And Remember this was smart days. enough to mix the uh, pilot back in that was pre-adjusted, so it didn't make your pilot bounce all around like the other composite clippers did. You also have to remember that that was the really the, the depth of the modulation wars. And when uh, Arno Meyer uh, had that infamous uh, SBA meeting in Philadelphia that uh, sparked the mod minder and the debate over the length of peaks, for those of you a little younger in the uh, industry. Uh, at one point, you could get a you could get a ticket for having a peak at all that was over seventy five kilohertz, 
And then it became a debate over how many milliseconds you can run a peak before it really was a peak. And how long the peak light stayed on. That was the difference between the Collins C1, C2, and C3 mod monitors. And don't take my word for it. Ask Jack. (laughs) You're showing your age, Barry. Up until 83, the rules actually had a, they defined a peak as, it was so many cycles of a thousand hertz and it, it worked out to one millisecond and said, okay, if this peak is briefer than one millisecond, you can ignore it completely. Um, not to, Of course, it was a time when the commission was still checking radio and television closely. We had a similar thing in late 70s, early 80s TV when we started using small tape on the air. When we started using umatic tape for news gathering, it, the blanking was not up to spec. Basically, the picture was not as big as the scan lines. Now, in practice, it was no worse than having a picture that doesn't quite fill the screen. If you have a movie and you put it on the screen, it's just not quite big enough. Um, a lot of stations would just put black around it or color video around it. But the commission would sit there and say, no, if the blanking is wider than this, we are going to cite you. And there was a lot of that. And at I some remember point said, we used to have pilot monitors, external pilot monitors. I had a Rusk, I think was the brand. Yep. And um, it had a little meter that would just go up a little bit. And then you pushed a button. And if it went up more, that meant it was that much positive. Or if it went down a little bit, that meant it was that much negative. And we were like that about as... Late as 70, 71, I found this in old, in old memos. I don't know, by 80, we weren't enforcing it. But if you did a mono newscast, sportscast, if you're going to be in mono for more than a couple of minutes, they wanted you to flip the switch and kill the pilot. And I guess on some stations, they started dumping it with the mic switch or something. Or if you turn on the newsroom pot, it would kill the pilot. And at some point, they realized, and I'm sure they thought of it as some kind of basic truth in advertising or truth in labeling that, well, stereo light says stereo and not everything you transmit will be. A lot of your spots weren't, dubs weren't always stereo. In fact, even if another station sent you a stereo dub, how often did you, you use the left channel or the right channel, whichever one was easier to understand. We replaced there that was- Rusk 19 kilohertz monitor with a new Collins that had a digital readout and it monitored your main frequency and your pilot. And it turns out one day, part of the digital readout quit working and I took it apart and it had a whole bunch of 327 lamps back in the back of it that shined through little bitty masks that projected the numbers up on the digital screen is how that thing worked. And one of the 327s was bad. So part of the eight didn't light up or something. Well, Ken, I would um, take that as a as a as a, a cue. What about when you listen to a competing station and you discover that one of their card slots is out of phase, or the whole station's out of phase, or something isn't right? Have you ever called them and told them, or have you been rebuffed? I actually had a proof to a station once that uh, they were running a a Beatles show and I had to show them how it was out of phase because no one was listening to it. And when they were playing the early stuff in stereo, it just didn't work. I had a Pioneer Super Tuner that had the mute button. I took the mute button and decided that I wanted to make a mono button for that purpose. The Super Tuner was a great radio. I've had a couple of occasions where I'll hear a station that the out of phase or, or missing channel is not as common, but you'll hear the funny background squeal or something. And it's dying stereo generator or dying exciter. Harris Digit has some failure modes that some of the power supply noise will get passed through, you know, at some point, and I would call the directors of engineering, and in one case, uh, Odessa or Midland area station, I called her DE in Dallas, and he's like, okay, I will have a guy look at it. His problem was his chief was dying. 
which you follow with, hi, can I help you with that? You know, I, uh, I do this sort of thing for hire these days. You know, a lot of stations now are running mono on FM uh, for getting away from multipath. I was tooling around South Georgia once listening to the 100 kilowatt FM at Florida State out of Tallahassee. So I called the chief and I said, hey, do you know you realize you're mono? And he said that was on purpose. So uh, I think a lot of talk stations have gone to that. It used to be it was very desirable to keep the uh, stereo pilot up because as you scan stations, it wouldn't stop unless it was there. Uh, so a, a lot of different stories about that. And then on the other hand, when we have a multi uh, simulcast in Atlanta, WS Am I unmuted? WSB uh, went to FM and the disc jockeys were saying, oh, that's nice. and, now, you hear me? and now FM stereo. And I called. Oh, the well, goodness me. Uh, I, there's a, a stereo. Uh, Who's saying you are? I just muted uh, hell. So this stereo mono is an, an old time and fun story a lot of radios that are coming around with that don't even have the stereo pilot light anymore anyway. I know I put some stations on University of Missouri. I had a aftermarket FM in the Buick that you could force it to listen to mono. You can't do that anymore. And that was an excellent way to keep track of uh, what cart machines and turntables were out of phase. I use that as a, as a tool. I bought a Sequera FM tuner when I was at Q102 in Dallas. That was probably the ultimate FM tuner ever built. In fact, uh, Sequera used to build the tuners for Marantz. And uh, this thing had a spectrum analyzer built in it. And um, it had a composite output. And so I took the composite output and fed it into an FMS1 Bilar and I literally had a spectrum analyzer and a frequency mo uh, variable mod monitor before anybody had that except QEI. And I had bought one of those and it was a piece of junk. So uh, I could see almost anything. And so uh, it was pretty easy to have great sound with that Sequera. And I think uh, there's a company now called Dave Sequera that uh, is an offshoot of that company that's building FM tuners. Yeah, Day have, Square have one was of by, uh, is owned by David Day, who bought all the um, um, Sequera. Yep. And yeah. if you ask them about it, they say it's the most expensive tuner ever made. It was. And now if you want to get the Spectrum Analyzer built, they have a um, an LCD screen replacement modification kit that costs like four grand. Yeah, I once asked David Day, I said, how could you charge that, this much for a tuner? He said, because I can. <laughs> That's, what... That's the American but the, the thing is yeah. that his stuff really is good. Yeah, it's just like Macintosh. Look what that stuff costs now. You know, uh, the cheapest thing they got is like about five or six grand, and that's just a Bono preamp or something. Hey, Barry, what, what about uh, devices that you've always wanted to open up and then you were disgusted when you found uh, out what was inside? I remember looking inside a Shulky box once. <laughs> Cobra Cam 89. It was the CB radio. And it was the best of the best. And I opened it up and there was nothing there. Somebody else's pay slip. My uh, big project as a student at the University of Missouri on our 300 watt FM was to convert it to stereo. We did it over Thanksgiving in 1972. And uh, we had an old iron fireman RCA transmitter. Remember that? With the exciters at half frequency with the Liz's U pattern on it. And then it would double it. And we wanted to, we got a TE1 exciter that I got at a cheap price out of KGRC and Hannibal. So we had to neutralize that and get FCC approval for it, which we did. It was a 4125 pushing two 4125s. And then we, uh, we, uh, we went, went stereo that way. But uh, that's because I called the RCA salesman in St. Louis, Dirk Freeman, 
I said, hey, I'm a junior in electrical engineering at the University of Missouri, Rolla. Can you help me convert my, my RCA transmitter to stereo? And he said, can't do it. You got to buy a new one. Well, if you're in sales only, you'll believe that. Hey, and I went to work at Mosley Associates in 1975. And in the back room, going through all the old parts and pieces, there's a, there's a kit called an SAK-1, a stereo adapter kit, which is how to put a stereo generator into that iron fireman exciter. And I just kind of shook my head because they wanted to put the uh, SCG-9, their first tube type stereo generator into that. That's a direct FM exciter, very wideband, and it included an REP-111C wideband transformer to, to get it all done. So I had a good a good uh, time chatting to Jack Mosley about where that came from. And that was kind of the genesis of his company because FM Stereo was authorized in 61. And he kind of grew out of that with the stereo STLs and stuff. Jack, talk to us if you would a little bit about that uh, exciter, the challenge that you had to make the TE3, was it? Yes. Terrible exciter model three. Uh oh, so you didn't was, you didn't solve the problems? That was the one that uh, Gates had that was lucky to stay in the band, much less within the uh, permissible deviation. <laughs> well, it was better than the TE one. <laughs> well, the TE one was the same thing. It was just the uh, three was cost reduced, which. Uh, yeah. The TE-1 on a bass guitar would unlock. Oh, yeah. Well, it was was never locked in the first place. They had it uh, referenced to a DC voltage, which uh, was wandering all over the place. Uh, when I went to work for Gates, uh, that was my first uh, project, was to uh, get the thing stabilized and it became the TE3. They skipped a generation in the number to sell it as a, a new project. But uh, the uh, thing that I, when I got up there, my uh, uh, boss, uh, uh, can't think of the old fellow's name, but he had been there forever. Said we're uh, we're going to do a product improvement project, and he gave me the uh, modulator card to uh, fix it. And I, uh, uh, Bill Hoyt was his name. He was a a lifer at, at uh, Gates Radio, really nice gentleman, but not very well trained uh, as far as uh, being able to develop a product. And uh, he gave me the uh, AFC module and I said, Bill, I need to have the modulator module and the AFC module in order to make it work because uh, they were, at that point, they were trying to do product improvement. And he had a uh, guy that they had pulled out of a, an HF section, uh, section that they had formed to go after uh, a VOA 500 kilowatt uh, project. And uh, that was one that Collins had, had won and uh, they delivered it on time and in specs. Gates lost out on that thing. But uh, that was for the VOA overseas services. And I finally talked Bill into letting me have the AFC card and the uh, modulator card. And uh, 
that point, my wife was still out in uh, California. So I had nothing to do at night. So I'd go down there at night and uh, work till about 10 o'clock and then go back home and get some rest and get up the next morning. And uh, I got rid of the, when I finally figured out what he was using for a, an unstable reference on it, I just shook my head and laughed for about a half an hour and then decided to, uh, I did talk him into giving me the AFC module and the modulator module. And we had a, a tenny chamber there that we could run the thing from minus 30 centigrade up to uh, about 150 uh, on the hot side and uh, really cook it and then freeze the daylights out of it. And uh, I, uh, Beyonce was still out on the West Coast. So I didn't have anything to do at night. So I'd go down there at night and uh, everything I could to insult it, to try to get it to move or to stabilize it or whatever. And uh, I finally, without Bill's permission, just decided to put a phase locked loop in the uh, automatic frequency control module. And uh, I uh, took it home with me when I, uh, I didn't tell him what I, what I was doing because he just wanted to uh, stabilize the design they had without making any significant changes in the circuitry. He thought you could do it with uh, just changing components. So I uh, secretly developed a phase locked loop AFC system. Didn't tell him what I was doing. And I don't think he, he was a nice guy, but he, he didn't, I don't know where he got his education, but I think most of it was working for Gates before Harris uh, Entertype bought them. And <laughs> I built a phase locked loop and they had a, an environmental chamber that you could run down to about minus 40 centigrade or yeah, centigrade up to enough to uh, fry the capacitors in the other directions. And uh, after about a week or a week and a half, I had that thing stabilized to the point where it would stay within, uh, I think the limit was what, two or three KC uh, deviation. Does anybody remember that in the rules? Two kilohertz on FM. Two kilohertz. Finally got the thing where it would uh, stay within uh, I don't know uh, I don't remember the numbers, but it would stay right on frequency and just deviate a little bit where you could if you read the monitor head on frequency monitor, you could see maybe a, hundred, 100, 200 cycles either side of better uh, frequency. And uh, I just let it, let the thing go over a weekend. And uh, I would uh, come in, uh, out every six hours and take note of where it was and what the uh, temperature was. 
I didn't have anything better to do at that point. And uh, he uh, sat me down when he and said, I want to see the schematic on this. And he looked at it. And, Where are all the missing parts? And I said, they're in the trash can. We don't need them anymore. <laughs> Finally got convinced that that was the way to go and they put that thing in production. I thought they were gonna call it the TE2, but they skipped the two and called it the TE3. And uh, we got it type accepted uh, uh, yes, four or five months later. Uh, the feds uh, in the uh, type acceptance group wanted to see this box because they had had uh, so many uh, citations issued, they wanted to look at it themselves. So I got a free trip to a uh, uh, town just outside of Washington, D.C., uh, where the uh, type acceptance group was. It was over in Northern Virginia, I think. And uh, we shipped them one and I brought another one with me when I uh, drove over there. And uh, they uh, asked them why they uh, insisted on having a, a copy of the real thing there. And, he said, we've had so many citations issued for that product that we just don't really trust them, trust the data they sent us. So I, I got a good chuckle out of that. And they said, okay, give me about five minutes and I'll, I'll have the uh, type acceptance issued and you can go back to Quincy. So uh, it was uh, quite an adventure. I'd never been to the uh, uh, labs over in uh, Northern Virginia. And at that point, I'm not sure I even knew they existed. But uh, Jack, was that right around the time that uh, Richard Johnson was building a stereo exciter for Wilkinson? I don't know, it may have been. This would have been, uh, God, I don't know, I can't even add two and two and come up with three uh, anymore in my head. Uh, but it was, uh, I was kind of amused because they, I had never been to the labs in Virginia. And, uh, The, uh, I've forgotten who the gentleman was that was in charge of uh, looking at type acceptance and stuff then because uh, they had had a lot of input from the field forces that uh, those things were wandering all up and down the band. And the thing that really upset them was when they got into the uh, aeronautical band because that was, uh, uh, they'd uh, somebody up on the high end of the FM band would move up a, a mega cycle or so and wipe out the uh, air to ground communications. And uh, that's what they were really concerned about with that exciter because they had had a lot of them that reports of them uh, fields uh, where somebody was flying an instrument uh, landing and all of a sudden they'd get a bunch of noise in that would uh, either uh, cause a, either block the uh, the ILS if you're using the land on the final approach and uh, 
it was a, a problem of safety to life. And that's what got them, got their attention. And uh, the field forces uh, may or may not have uh, caught, uh, caught the problem, but uh, when it uh, interfered with an instrument landing uh, path at a, an airport nearby a transmitter site, that got the FAA's permission or attention and they would, uh, would go shut them, force them to shut down until they could get the problem fixed. But uh, it took me about 30 days to get that thing developed and then about another 60 days to be sure it was doing what I thought it was and uh, to get all the documentation changed where uh, was it involved uh, both the uh, modulator module which sat as I recall up in the upper right hand corner of the cabinet that had that fold down thing and the uh, which was next to one of the uh, uh, subcarrier inputs uh, or modules and, and all of that. And they were trying to keep that thing on frequency by stabilizing the temperature that was frying the uh, modulator card. Uh, that was a fun project. Well, you just had a lot of gear over the years, Jack, uh, both that exciter, a console. You built one of the AM stereo monitors, wasn't it? Uh, generator. Generator. Yeah. Uh, the monitors were made by initially by... Uh, Jim Tony, when he moved out to work for Jack uh, uh, out in Santa Barbara. Mosley. Jack Mosley, yeah. yeah he uh, left KBIM in Roswell, and uh, I replaced him at KGRT in Las Cruces when he got a letter from those friends and neighbors of his up in Albuquerque that uh, offered him a job in the uh, military. <laughs> and I replaced him at KGRT. And uh, then when he got back from the service, uh, he went over to KBIM in Roswell, which was where the uh, owners were at the Las Cruces station. About a year later, I transferred to uh, Arizona State to get some courses that Sand Dunes Tech and Las Cruces didn't have. And uh, it took me a couple of years over there to finish out my education. And, uh, After that, I, uh, Vietnam was uh, going full blast and I uh, took a job out in California with Paul Gregg for a short period of time. At the same time was uh, oh, I don't remember. I that was later, I guess. I came back to uh, Collins, and uh, they were had a plant in Richardson at that point. And I took a propo scatter system 
that Collins had uh, developed over to Vietnam as a civilian before the friends and neighbors invited me to carry a rifle. I was over there for about a year and a half and then uh, things started uh, slowing down over there and I got all of our reps trained on this new communication system. I came back uh, I guess I went back and finished, finished school over at uh, Arizona State and uh, finished uh, then and I never got called up after that because I'd already been over there. <laughs> so you were with Gates before you went with, uh, with uh, uh, Paul. Yeah. And then uh, you didn't follow him to see Dex Sparta, though. No, uh huh? No. That's when you went to Collins, I would gather. I went, uh, met my wife out in California. She was a school teacher. I uh, had a bunch of. Uh, Canadian nurses that worked for uh, Dr. Shumway's uh, heart transplant group up at Stanford University. Her one night, there were a bunch of Canadian nurses there and she was had, had just moved out to uh, California and uh, Anyway, I uh, met her out there, and then uh, after uh, they shut down Paul Gregg's uh, company that I was working for out there, I went back to uh, the Gates again for a year, year and a half or so couple of years, we got married the next summer and I never did get called up because I'd already been over there. So I didn't get a, an invitation from your friends and neighbors to uh, come carry a rifle and go back over there again. Been here in Texas ever since. Holy cow, where'd you get that? <laughs> we have our spies everywhere. Yeah. Why don't you send me a copy of that? <laughs> sure. Be happy to. That was a long time. That was my second tour with uh, Collins and I stayed here. Well, we made a trip through uh, Ohio up at WGAR in Cleveland, 50 kilowatt on uh, a Mexican clear on 1200. And then wound up back in Texas. We've been here ever since. Jack Lark here. Yeah. So, uh, as you know, uh, Lloyd uh, Winters, I worked for him for a short time. Yeah. And, uh, he bragged on you so much. He said that you could draw, the, what was it, the 310Z and probably the 831 transmitter by memory, part by part, on a piece of paper upon demand. Yeah. <laughs> He was the best boss I ever had. He gave me a, a just a, anything I wanted to work on. 
that needed working on. Uh, to tell me what he wanted to see and then turn me loose. He was the best boss I ever had. And I, I just, I miss him so much. The people of your, of your, of your group, Jack, I think of Hilmer Swanson. I remember how Lloyd, we would sit around, he would speak so lovingly of, yeah. of, of uh, Hilmer. And I would, you know, and then of course, uh, all, you know, all the others. Uh, I gotta well, tell I, you. Hilmer was, was up at Quincy the same time I was. And uh, he was working on a project that they, they were trying to get a, in the FM or a HF business. I only can, uh, and contribution that was worth anything to that company was uh, the uh, TE3 modulator and exciter cards. I had to twist my boss's arm to get him to let me uh, use a phase locked loop instead of that DC reference they had in it. But he was a nice guy, but I don't think he had a had much of an educational background. You worked with Dave Spence or Spence? What was his name? S. D. Spence. Was that Dave Spence? Yeah, I think so. He was like the head honcho out at Collins for a while. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, they. Uh, they gave us a free hand to, uh, after Art got kicked out of it, uh, they just gave us a free hand to do, work on anything we needed to. And even if it was just experimental, it was back to how Art used to do it in Cedar Rapids. And he was still there hanging on, but they, that uh, VOA 500 kilowatt automatically tuned project uh, bankrupted the company. And uh, they kept him around when it came out of bankrupts, bankruptcy. But uh, he really didn't have any uh, say and who did what on on uh, what project. I got to meet him a couple of times when I was working on the uh, cider problems that they had and he came in the lab one night when I was down there Checking the uh, three engineering models we built of the new modulator and AFC cards. And boy, he grilled me on how it worked and everything. I think he, I gave him a schematic of it. And he just looked at it and he knew what was going on, but he grilled me up one side and down the other on how it worked. Explained it to him and he just kind of chuckled and said, you got that right, kid, and walked out the door and I never saw him again. He was, he was a very, he, he was a real slave driver on the uh, VOA five kil, uh, 500 kilowatt automatically tuned uh, transmitter and they lost their shirts on it. And that's what put them into bankruptcy. And uh, in order to get out of bankruptcy, he couldn't dictate anything to anybody anymore. But uh, he was a really brilliant gentleman.
That's about all I can say. Contribute. Well, good. We appreciate those memories. Know that you've got a lot of history there, and if we pick the right topic at the right day, yeah, it's enjoyable. And we thank you. 